Now we're shifting gears from confidence intervals to something called a test of hypothesis. Section 9.1 covers the basics of hypothesis testing, and I'm going to ease you into hypothesis testing with this section. You will notice some similarities between what we did with confidence intervals and what we're doing with test of hypotheses. As a matter of fact, when you look on your calculator and hit stat tests, what we've been using so far was like number 7 and 8, the Z intervals and the T intervals. Numbers 1 and 2 are the z-test and the t-test. If anything up here ends in test, that means that it's a test of hypothesis that we're talking about. If it ends in int or interval, then it's a confidence interval. That's how you tell is the last part of that command. We start this section by defining the null and the alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis is represented by h sub naught. Not is an old-fashioned word that means zero. We use a h with a subscript of zero, then we put a colon, then we put our parameter down that we're testing a claim about equals some number. The null hypothesis always contains equality. The alternative hypothesis, on the other hand, is h sub 1. Some books will use h sub a, a for alternative. This is using the binary notation like zeros and ones. If it's not the null, then it's the alternative. Once you establish what your null hypothesis is, your alternative hypothesis will use the same parameter and the same number, but it won't have equality. Your options or your choices here will either be greater than, less than or not equal to. And as we see later on, this alternative hypothesis will determine what type of test we do. We only choose one of these. A study published in the Journal of Air and Waste Management Association reported that the mean amount of particulate matter produced by cars and light trucks in an urban setting is 35 milligrams of PM per mile of travel. Suppose that a new engine design is proposed that is intended to reduce the amount of PM in the air. There are two possible outcomes that could happen with the new engine design. Either it will reduce the level of PM or it won't. These possibilities are called hypotheses. One of the hypotheses is called the null hypothesis. The other is called the alternative hypothesis. For this scenario, our null hypothesis is about the mean amount of the particulate that is emitted by the car. So we're testing a claim about the mean and the amount of particulate is 35 milligrams. So here's our population parameter that we would be testing a claim about and the number we use is the amount that's already been established. The null hypothesis uses the numbers from the status quo, what we've already accepted, or some predetermined value. The new design is intended to reduce that amount. If it reduces the amount, what would our alternative hypothesis be? We know we need to have the same parameter and the same number, but if it reduces it, will this be greater than, less than, or not equal to? Less than. That's how you come up with your alternative hypothesis. It's pretty straightforward. The null hypothesis about a parameter states that the parameter is equal to a specific number. It always contains equality. The alternative hypothesis will either be less than, greater than, or not equal to. If the alternative hypothesis has a less than in it, then that produces what we call a left-tailed test. If we're testing a claim about a mean, we're either going to be using a normal distribution or a T distribution, depending on whether or not we know the population standard deviation. For a left-tailed test, we would reject with our critical region on the left-hand side. This critical value would be Z sub alpha, and it's to the left, and this area right here is alpha, where alpha is what we call our significance level. The most common value for the significance level is 0.05. An alpha level of 0.05 corresponds to a 95% confidence interval. That alpha that we use for the confidence interval will now be the alpha that we use in our test of hypotheses. What we're going to do later on, not tonight, but next time, is we're going to learn how to calculate a test statistic, and if that test statistic falls in this alpha region, this rejection region, we would reject our null hypothesis. Notice on this one, the inequality is pointing to the left, and that indicates the direction of the tail of the test. It's not a happy coincidence. It's by design. If our inequality were greater than, then our rejection region would all be in the right-hand side, and we would have just one critical value, z sub alpha, not z sub alpha over 2. Notice this inequality points to the right-hand side, and this would be the right-tailed test. For a not equal to, 
That means we don't know if it's going to be bigger or smaller, so we have to evenly split our rejection region over two tails so that this area on the left is alpha over 2, and this area on the right is alpha over 2, and it gives us two critical values, negative z sub alpha over 2 and positive z sub alpha over 2 if we're testing a claim about a mean. Because zero is in the middle of both the normal and the t distribution, these numbers would be the same value but opposite signs. The not equal to results in a two-tailed test. In example one, I'm just asked to state the appropriate null and alternative hypothesis. I'm also going to add that I want you to tell me if it's going to be a left tail, right tail, or two tail test. So let's read it. It says boxes of a certain kind of cereal are labeled as containing 20 ounces. An inspector thinks the mean weight may be less than this. State the appropriate null and alternative hypothesis. Our null hypothesis has to have a parameter. What will that parameter be? Mu, the mean. Then we put it equals for the null hypothesis, and then the 20 ounces will be the number. But you have to have all of these parts. You need your notation to indicate that this is a null hypothesis. We separate the hypothesis with a colon. Then your parameter equals a number. Your alternative hypothesis has the same parameter and the same number. What will the inequality be here? Less than, because that's what we were told in the problem. If I were to draw a picture to represent what's happening here, I would draw a symmetric bell-shaped curve. And where would my alpha be? On the left, on the right, or both? the left side. So all of my alpha would be right here and I would end up with a negative critical value and we would call this a left tailed test. Do you see how when I'm reading I look for what my parameter is and then something to indicate whether it's going to be less than, greater than, or not equal to? Next example. Last year the mean monthly rent for an apartment in a certain city was $800. A real estate agent believes that the mean rent is higher this year. What are the key words in this problem? mean and higher. So what would my null hypothesis be? Mu equals 800. And my alternative, when I draw a picture to represent what's happening, I draw a normal curve or at least a T distribution. They're both symmetric and unimodal. Will my alpha level be on the left, the right, or split between two tails? So my critical value would be a positive number. And this would be a right-tailed test. Example 3. Scores on a standardized test have a mean of 70. Some modifications are made to the test and an educator believes that the mean may have changed. State the appropriate null and alternative hypothesis. What are the key words here? Mean and change. Does change indicate bigger or smaller? No, so it would just be different. So my null hypothesis here would be that the mean is equal to 70 and my alternative would be what? The mean is not equal to 70. When I draw the graph to represent or model the problem, where will my alpha level be? Both tails. So what is this area going to be now in each of the two tails? Alpha over 2. It has to be evenly split. So I would have two critical values, one negative and one positive. And this would be what we call a two-tail test. I like this analogy of explaining what a test of hypothesis is and relating it to something that we're familiar with. The purpose of a hypothesis test is to determine how likely it is that the null hypothesis is true. We can think of it as a criminal trial. In a criminal trial, the defendant is brought into court and what is the assumption about that defendant? We assume that they're innocent. In a test of hypotheses for statistics, we assume the null hypothesis is true. We start out both of these things with an assumption. Then the DA presents his evidence. In a statistical study, gathering your data and analyzing your data is our evidence. In a criminal trial, the jury makes a decision, just like we have to make a decision about the assumption. Here, we assumed that the person was innocent. They have to decide, is the person guilty or not guilty? You will never hear a judge declare a defendant innocent. Think about it. Have you ever been watching Law and & Order and heard somebody say they're innocent? No, they say not guilty. The reason they don't declare them innocent is because you cannot prove something that you assume. The worst you can do is say there's not enough evidence to reject this assumption. That's why we say not guilty. If I have a lot of evidence that says, no, there's no way. 
and I reject this assumption, then I've proven that that person is guilty. In a statistical study, we assume the null hypothesis is true, we look at the evidence, and then we decide whether we reject the null hypothesis, thereby proving the alternative, or we fail to reject the null hypothesis. That's all you can do. You never accept or prove a null hypothesis. You can either reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject the null hypothesis. You cannot prove an assumption, so we never accept the null hypothesis because we assume that it's true. If we do end up rejecting the null hypothesis, we have proven that the alternative is true. The null and the alternative are opposite of each other, just like guilty and innocent are opposite of each other. If you reject innocent, you've proven guilty. If I reject the null, I've proven the alternative. Consequently, the alternative hypothesis is the only thing that we can prove, and that is why it's sometimes referred to as the research hypothesis, because it's the only one that can be proven true. The alternative hypothesis is the research hypothesis. It can be proven true. The null hypothesis can only be failed to reject, not accepted. That helps us in understanding how we can state conclusions. We may either reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject it. If we reject the null hypothesis, we're saying that's not it, then it's got to be the other one. If we reject the null, we accept the alternative. However, if we fail to reject the null, we just say there's not enough evidence to prove the alternative. In example one, we're told that boxes of a certain kind of cereal are labeled as containing 20 ounces. Here's our null and our alternative that we came up with earlier. We reject the null hypothesis, so what would our conclusion be? If we reject the null, what do we prove? And what we can say then is that the mean weight of the cereal is indeed less than 20 ounces. Since this alternative was the mean weight is 20 ounces and it's true, we can draw that conclusion. In example two, same scenario, only now this time we don't reject the null hypothesis. So does that mean that we can say that the mean weight is 20 ounces? We can't say that because that would be the equivalent of accepting the null and we don't do that. The abbreviation I use for fail to reject the null hypothesis just to save on writing is F2R H sub naught. If we fail to reject the null hypothesis, that means there's not enough evidence to prove the alternative. So what we would say here is there's not enough evidence to conclude that the mean weight is less than 20 ounces. If we failed to reject the null hypothesis here, we could conclude that there is insufficient statistical evidence to conclude the mean weight is less than 20 ounces. When we rejected the null, we said the mean weight is less than 20 ounces. If we failed to reject the null, we just say we can't say that the mean weight's less than 20 ounces. But that doesn't mean that we're claiming that the average weight is 20 ounces. Objective three is to distinguish between type one and type two errors. When a hypothesis test is conducted and a decision is made, there is a possibility that it is the wrong decision. There are two ways in which a wrong decision may occur within a hypothesis. The first one we call a type one error, the second one we call a type two error. Over here are the decisions that we make. Over here is the truth of the situation about the null hypothesis. In a criminal trial, if you're accused of a crime, there is a truth to your guilt or innocence. Only you and God know that truth, beyond a shadow of a doubt. Other people may feel strongly one way or the other, but honestly, only the accused and God know the truth. That's still going to trial. There will be a jury that makes a decision. Sometimes they make the right decision. If we reject a claim of innocence, but the person really is innocent, because the null is true, we've made a type one error. The type one error in statistics is our alpha. We want our type one error to be small. This would be the equivalent of sending an innocent man to jail if we're talking about a criminal trial. We don't like that. Now, if the truth is the person on trial is guilty and we reject innocent, we made a correct decision. We just sent a guilty man to jail. If the truth of the situation is that the person is innocent, but we said that we didn't reject innocence, we let an innocent man go free. We made a correct decision. If the truth is that the person is guilty, because remember in the criminal trial the null hypothesis is innocence, if that person is guilty but we failed to reject innocence, 
We let a guilty man walk. That's called a type 2 error. We use beta to denote a type 2 error. One of these errors is worse than the other. In our society, we would rather see a guilty man go free than an innocent man go to jail. In statistics, we would rather risk a type 2 error of failing to reject a false null hypothesis than rejecting a true null hypothesis. These two types of error are inversely proportional. So as alpha goes down, beta goes up. So we don't want to let alpha get too small because it makes beta be too big and vice versa. In this problem we're asked to determine whether or not we have a type 1 error, a type 2 error, or did we make a correct decision. The dean of a business school wants to determine whether the mean starting salary of graduates of her school is greater than $50,000. She will perform a hypothesis test with the following null and alternative hypothesis. Suppose that the true mean is $50,000. If the true mean is $50,000, that means our null hypothesis is true. And the dean rejected the null hypothesis. We rejected a true null hypothesis. What type of error is this? Type 1. In the next example, same scenario, suppose that the, that the true mean is $55,000. So now our null hypothesis is false. In this problem, the null hypothesis is that the mean salary is $50,000 when in truth it's $55,000. So that means our null hypothesis is false. The dean rejected the false null hypothesis. So what happened here? Don't we want to reject a false null hypothesis? This was a correct decision. It was false. We rejected it. All is right with the world. Up here, it was true. We rejected it. That's a type 1 error. The dean of the business school, same thing. Suppose now the true mean is $55,000, so that means that our null hypothesis is false. The dean does not reject a false null hypothesis, so is that a type 1, type 2, or correct decision? Type 2. Look at the graph. Failing to reject a false null hypothesis is a type 2 error. Remember, with the null hypothesis, it always contains equality. The alternative hypothesis will be greater than, less than, or not equal to. Furthermore, the alternative hypothesis determines whether or not we have a left tail, right tail, or two-tailed test using less than, greater than, and not equal to. Notice these point in the direction of the tail. The not equal to will say points in both directions.